decision making in pharma and pharma science or Scientology probably gives away what I'm going to say, but uh, I think it is an appropriate title. Let's see if we can work this. So this is just some contents. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to whiz through, but uh, hopefully uh, we can get through these the, 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 these topics. What is decision making? What can the statisticians do working with their colleagues? What can we do to kind of improve the, the quality of our decision making? Some things are statistical, some things are just plain common sense. But let's have a little talk about that. Um, and then uh, hopefully uh, there'll be time for some questions and we'll take it from there. Okay, so uh, most of you guys will be familiar with this. It's a, it's a, um, a reference now, it's a little old, but it, it's, it's exactly the same now as it was then, is that there is a very high, our industry is full of late stage failures. I mean, there's a lot. And uh, from these particular publications, failure rates of 80% in phase two and 50% in phase three, very high. And, um, and the two -thirds, it was said two thirds of these failures did you not, because you, when you got to phase three, you didn't get a positive outcome. It wasn't safety, it was a failure to show efficacy. Now, you can understand a failure due to safety, some unexpected side effect arises in larger phase trials. That's very unfortunate. But a failure for, for efficacy is unforgivable. Something went wrong uh, to, to result in that failure. And uh, according to these authors, and I tend to agree with it, it reflects poorly on like the phase two design piece and how we make decisions about dose and populations and how we go forward. And um, you know, just in our industry, it's absolutely critical that we make best use of those phase type two data and put the best designs we can forward and put the best thinking about what those data mean so we can you know, try and increase our likelihood of success. I'll just make a quick side comment here. Just think, think for the only other industry that I can think is analogous to, to, to pharma in terms of the, the amount of regulation, putting the financial industry to one side, because well, not that regulation works there, but the, um, is uh, air, the airline industry. You know, if you're Boeing or Airbus, you're going to make an airplane, you're going to put hundreds of people on it. There's a very rigorous process that's involved in development and, and construction and testing of those aircraft. And there's a rigorous um, schema that takes place ongoing uh, maintenance and evaluation of the aircraft is needed in order that, that, it, that it's airworthy and you're not going to, you know, kill hundreds of people. Now, if, if Boeing developing a new aircraft or Airbus if half of their new aircraft that they've spent billions of dollars on, they get to the point where they're going to put some passengers on it and take off, oh, no, sorry, it doesn't work. You know, we got the wrong engines, you know, goodness gracious me. So we just shove that one out of the way and we'll start again and spend billions on the next one. How long do you think Boeing or the others could survive if half of their aircraft got to the point of selling to whomever and they said, oh, sorry, it's broken? It actually, those jet engines didn't work the way we thought they were going to do, so therefore, you, you wouldn't survive. That in, that they would be out of business. So it's an interesting thought to ask why is pharma still in business with an atrocious failure rate? Anyway, okay, so something to think about. So decision making, you can, there's millions of de definitions. I just ch choose this, I chose this one, they're all more or less the same. But it says some important things about choosing between alternatives uh, based on the goals that you're looking for, uh, that the person or group is looking for. Good quality decision making requires a thorough analysis of the available information and consideration of alternatives in an unbiased manner. I would conjecture that this seldom happens in Palmer. Um, and we'll see some examples. And we need to do what we can to make that better. So that. Sounds good, uh, but it's not so easy in practice when you come to, uh, when, when you're inside a company and you've got your data and it isn't exactly what you wanted. There's a lot of pressure on the company. The life of the company may depend on this single product. There's a lot of pressure. So what, well, it's all good and well to talk about the principles of making a good decision, but now you're faced with, you know, you've got three days, you've got to make a press release. What are you going to say? How do you handle this issue? You know, people get, cons you know, it's, it's a, there's a lot at stake. So decision making is influenced by much more than the, the science involved, is what I'm saying. 
And um, you know what, what constitutes a good decision? So in pharma, so I'm just going to characterize it with an example. So stiff upper lip pharma is in a difficult spot. Lots of products are approaching the end of their patent life and action needs to be taken to replenish that, that pipeline because all the, 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 the money coming in is going to start dying away. So the in-licensing group has Big Drugs and Co. in a bear hug regarding the purchase of a sexy new immuno-oncology drug and the big drugs company only want $25 million with a, with a modest future royalties. It's a fabulous deal financially. Uh, the competitor, Hedgehog Pharma, have a similar drug in the same class, and that's been approved and it's generating big sales. And so now Stiffer Billet uh, Pharma can get kind of like a, a drug in that class. And uh, the terms... Um, that the big drugs company are putting forward are absolutely fantastic as a bargain. So you would think you'd move forward with that. However, it soon revealed that this drug um, has, uh, has actually already been trialed in two large randomized trials um, in the same indication as Hedgehog Farm, you know, the one with the drug that's making all the money. So same, same indication. Both of these trials failed to meet the primary endpoint. So it's in the same class, but it did two, two studies, same indication, and failed. But, okay, okay, don't worry, though. So, well, okay, because the in-licensing team consider these two trials had design flaws. They're not being specific about it, they're just design flaws. So there was problems with this. Eh? So the plan is, we'll in-license this, this thing for 25 million and go straight, straight into phase three in a new therapy, non-small cell lung, straight in as a monotherapy versus gold standard treatment that's proven survival benefits. They go head to head. And that development's going to cost about 80 million and they expect the future, future values 350 million. The new drug, this new drug that we're going to in-license that failed the two phase three trials has never been dosed as monotherapy to a single human being ever. And you're going to go straight in against a proven, a proven uh, 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 sorry, the, the, the leading drug with a survival advantage. You're going to randomize against that. So that's the question. What would you do? Anybody want? Any anybody brave? What would you do? Nobody is brave. <laughs> okay. Uh, I didn't, this bit I didn't write on the slide uh, because, uh, yes, in license that drug and that drug, so, uh, you know, be careful not to incriminate, but that drug is still in the pipeline of stiffer up, uh, <laughs> stiff upper lip pharma 15 years down the line and hasn't got a single indication in a single disease area. It was actually trialed in combination with another agent. So you had another agent, this drug, as one arm, and then the other arm was a different agent by itself. So agent X here, agent X plus this drug we're talking about, and then control. And so much damage was the combination doing that that, that arm literally had to be, you had to change the protocols to say that it's not the combination we're interested in, it's drug X alone, because when we add this other drug to it, it was doing so badly that they had to kind of pull away from it. And it's still not approved in any indication as we speak today. And, um, it, it, but it was in licensed, and it was an absolutely stupid decision, let me be honest, because it was blatantly obvious it didn't work, and that nobody was going to randomize a new drug this new entity that's not been given to a single non-small cell lung patient, randomize that against a proven active. You don't even you don't know what the dose is. You don't know. So, so the investigator said, I'm not randomizing that. That's crazy talk. And it never happened. So not, not that trial didn't happen, but they still hung on to it. And even today, that is a waste of money, even today. So you'd think that pharma decision-making is driven by logic, data, rational thinking, persuasion, all these things. But 
But unfortunately, um, and I think this applies equally to large and small, but it is particularly prevalent in the large. It's just not the case, unfortunately. So, as I said, you may have seen this before. It's just a little cartoon. I'm starting a, a team <laughs> to... <laughs> you read it already. Uh, so, so you could read it. I mean, that, that is actually what it's about, really, truly. So you're using a bad decision-making process to, to decide how to fix our bad decision-making process. Um, I, don't, I don't know how else we could secure, a, you know, find the, uh, we could find a source of the problem. X-ray your skull is what it is. <laughs> and unfortunately, I mean, I've had, I mean, I stand here and I can criticize it, but I, honestly, hand on heart, I've had toe-to-toe, -to -toe, face to face blazing arguments with senior execs about how stupid they are for the money they're wasting. So I know I couldn't last that long in a big company because <laughs> you, can't, you can't speak your mind, you can't speak truth. But uh, anyway, so let's have a little look at... It's easy to point out issues and say, why on earth have you done that? That's crazy. But it's another one to say, well, how can you maybe try and improve things a little bit? Um, and so I just... There's loads of things you can do statistically. We could talk here for hours. So I'm going to be very specific about a few things that we can do. Um, so here's a situation, phase three uh, uh, trial situation. I'm just being oncology. You have some phase two data, 120 subjects. You can, oops, back there, there we go. Sorry, 120 subjects, and you've got this hazard ratio. Hopefully, you're familiar with that. So that shows that the risk of, uh, of the event is 25% lower. 0.7, so, so there's some evidence. It's not significant, but it wasn't meant to be. It's a phase two, but it's promising. And, um, and then somebody calls the statistician and says, what, how big will a phase three be? Now, uh, how big will a phase three need to be? And it does some calculations, and it's 950 patients, 90% power, alpha of 2.5 one-sided. And that, um, and there's a little footnote there as to how that was calculated, but that's what he comes up with. Okay, and he's okay. Okay, that's what we've got to do. So let's look at that. Now, most people, let me go back and ask a quick question. A quick question. Um, at the bottom of the slide, what is the chance of success in that study? Remember, it has 90% power. So what's the chance of success? What, what most people, does anybody dare to have a guess? It, that, what's the chance that the phase three will give you a positive p-value? Put it that way. What's the chance that this phase three, when you do it, under the assumptions that you've made, what's the chance that you'll get a positive outcome, that you'll get a p-value less than 0.25 and say, hooray, we have an improvement, let's go and get the drug licensed. M most people think it's 90% because you've got 90% power. That is absolutely untrue. <laughs> every, for every single trial you've ever seen, as a power statement, it's untrue. Why is it untrue? Okay. Because what you do is you do something very silly is we say, okay, what you're actually saying when you design that study is that, that the risk ratio has only got two possible values. It's either there's no effect whatsoever, so the, the risk ratio is the same between the two, nothing. And that's, it's either that with 100% probability or it's this 25% improvement with 100% probability. It is not possible to have anything in between. Which just a moment's thought says that's utter nonsense. You don't, that's clearly not reality. It's not true. But that is how the statisticians are here know that's how they design studies and are powered and have been done for decades. But it's not true. So you can just look at it in a simple sense down here. If I can get the little pointer to work again. Let's look at that. So you've got the way it's set up is you have a 0.25% uh, chance that if, if, well, do it this way. If the drug's effective, then there's a 90% chance that you'll if it's effective, that you'll get a positive result. If it's ineffective, the chance that you'll get a positive result is 0.025. And you can do the same calculations over here in terms of what if the drug, uh, what if the, the, this null is true or the al alternative is true, and you can calculate these problems. It's very simple. It's not complicated, okay? That's, a, that's the design. So you can just do some very simple math now and say, so what's, what's but the question then is, is what is the chance that 
this is the true result, or this is the true, it can't be 100% for either one of them, surely. So what is it really? What is it really? So you can use your phase two data, because you've got data from phase two. So you get the statistician, you can plot one of these. And this says, this, this is just my phase two data. Remember, this is exactly what was on the other slide. I'm just presenting this data as a 2D graphic. So this is the true hazard on the bottom. If you're over on this side, that's good outcome because it's a low hazard ratio. And if you're on this side, it's kind of getting worse. That means the risk is going up. So what I did is I cut it in half at 0.85 because kind of that side is kind of 0.75 or 0.85 or more, and this side is 0.85 or worse, just to dichotomize it around about the assumed treatment benefit. So I just so my phase two tell me there's a 70% chance that the true treatment treatment benefit is 0.85 or better, and there's a 30% chance it's 0.85 or worse. Okay. Note that that is rather different than 100 and 100. So now I've got that information. I just go back and I can just recalculate here. And I can say, okay, let me show you. Sorry, that was incorrect. So that's the table I had before. The chance that the hazard is one is about 30%. The chance that it has about point is about 70 from the graph over the page. Now I can just do a simple calculation. It's 0 0.025 times 30 plus here. I'm just going to point because that's that times 30 and that times 0 0.64. The chance of success is about 64%. It's not 90. You can do that for any trial you want. And there's reasons, I won't go into it, but there's reasons why trials that are designed at 90% power, powered on the same as a phase two, that this number will usually come out about 65, 67. There's, ma there's mathematical, but I won't go into it. Well, why, why did you cut it 50, 50? I mean, why, why 85? Oh, because all I was doing was, because the, the hypothesis was one or 75, yes. so I'm trying to distinguish between one and 75, so I was trying to take a value that was somewhere in between one and 75. Okay, okay so on, on that, you see, because I've got one and 0.75 and I'm trying to figure out which one. So I just take some, so I could, I could have done 0.8 or 0.9, something in between the two. Yeah, now, but, but you ask a more general question, which I'll address in a minute, okay. which is there's more possibilities than this simple mm -hmm. coloring. But I was doing that just for the point that you can easily do this yourself. It's not difficult to, if you've got some phase two and you can see straight away, that, uh, so there's a situation where in phase three, you, you've got 90% power. The company thinks there's a 90% chance of success, but there isn't. And then they fail and say, my study was 90% power. So, well, no, nah, well, really, what? It was only 90% assuming the truth. So this calculation, which any statistician can do, is quite insightful about your real chance of success. Uh, now, to, to the point you raised is you can, I can get more out of that phase two data. I can look at what's the chance the true difference is, you know, in each of these little intervals. Because it could be anywhere along there. It's more likely to be in the middle. I, I did a simple split just for the purposes of calculation. But the best way is to look at all the possibilities and say, right, take into account all the possibility for the treatment difference. What's the chance of success in my phase three? It's, it's, this is called expected power. Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it, it, there's terminology used called assurance, which has no scientific meaning. Somebody made it up. It's, it's called expect, the correct terminology, expected power. So I just do some calculations. I can, all I've done here is calculate the area of each of these bars. So what's the chance the true difference is in this range is here. It's just the area of, of each of these different colored pieces. I can then get fancy and add a whole bunch of stuff. Whereas I just take this table here now and I replicate it over here. Okay, so there's my intervals. What's the chance that the true benefit is in this interval? What's the power if the true dif difference was in that interval? And then I just multiply one by the other, add it up, we get 68.3. That is, see I got 64 when I did it in a simple way. It wasn't a bad guess compared to when you do it more sophisticated. Yeah, yeah, it all depends, what, but it's not 90. It's not 90. The question is, what, to, to me, it's not, it's not my role, I don't think, to say, hey, you can't do, you can't do developments if your chance of success is 90%, because that's not. Yeah, exactly. All, all, you, all you're doing is providing information, so you make an informed decision. 
Uh, otherwise, you know, a lot of things are done kind of a little bit without really, without folks really knowing what the true chance of success is. And these, these are easy for statisticians to do. This is not hard. You can program that in an Excel sheet, you know, in any financial statistics. And so it's not hard to do it. Oh, and this stuff is called assurance, as I just said. I'm not going to go through all of this, but there's some limitations with it. I won't go through it, uh, the, uh, all of them in detail. But the, what I've used, I've, success I've defined as P less than 025. That's my success criteria. But it might be that you need not just that, but you need to see a difference of 20% as well because the competitor's got 15 and you, it's not just good enough to be significant. You need a difference, you need a treatment, an observed result that's, at least, that's competitive with what somebody else has got. So you can redefine what success is and just do the exercise again and calculate POS for that. Uh, so that's straightforward. Um, have to be careful because of your phase two data, how much do they reflect the phase three? In my example, they were closely ref reflective, so I could use it. Sometimes you have to use somebody's external data because they've done a trial and you haven't got the same phase two. Uh, so just bear in mind, the, what I'm doing, I'm using a phase two data as a prior. So you've got to make sure that that prior is sensible versus the phase three. Uh, I'm not going to go into that. There's a, a statistical issue about whether the phase two data should in some sense be downweighted. That's a whole conversation by itself. And what I've done here is I've used the phase two to inform me about the likely benefit of drug. That's what I've, I've done. I have not made it up. One of the biggest problems with this kind of this Bayesian approach is this thing called prior elicitation. Have, any, have anybody heard of prior elicitation? So anyway, really quickly, that's where you ask a whole bunch of people, what do you think? Do you think our drugs are good or bad? Do you think we'll have a 20% improvement, 5% improvement? Let's ask some experts. You get a bunch of opinion, and then you put a <laughs> and then you dress it up in mathematics. Absolutely useless. Total rubbish. Should be banned. All that should be done. You've got to use the actual randomized control data. I take that a million times a day over somebody else's opinion. So be careful, because sometimes some GSK, for example, do a lot of this. They have statisticians employed full time to do prior elicitation, to ask people what their opinions are. I kid you not. Crazy. <laughs> Don't, I'll skip past that one. I'm going to go past that one, because too much. Uh, and then we can do, I'll do this quickly, because I'm thinking about time, because I'm going to run out. Um, you can use this kind of approach to I tackle a question like, well, I'm thinking about a program. I'm thinking of a phase two of this design. Um, and then if it's positive, then my phase three will look like this. Without having any data, you can use these kind of techniques to give you an understanding of what that program looks like and what success might look like. So here's a simple example. A uh, new drug, a phase two is planned. We haven't done it yet. And uh, the sponsor's already said a phase three Tumblr per group, that kind of power, we can tolerate that, we can live with that, we can afford that. That's about what we can deal with if the POS is sufficiently high based on the phase two, which we haven't got yet. But they have an idea of budget and so on. So how do you assess that? What is the phase two size? How do you decide if phase three is worth doing, et cetera, et cetera? So you can go away and you can say, OK, what is the chance of success in the phase three given certain outcomes in phase two. So you can have in the column here, it's hard to see them. There we are. This is the possible um, treatment effects, the difference between drug and placebo in the phase two. These are just what you might see. You might have a 25% improvement, 15, five, you know, big improvement, small improvement. And this is the size of the phase two, 20, 30, 40, 50. And you can say, what is the chance that if I have a phase two with 30 subjects per arm, and I have a 20% difference I see in the phase two, what's the chance that phase three with 200 patients per arm or whatever it was would be, would be positive? You can, you can do that. And that. So these here tell you that for any row and column, for that outcome in phase two with that sample size in phase two, that is the chance your phase three would then be successful. And I haven't got a single patient yet. You can do those things. You can explore the value of the phase three that you can afford. If you did this exercise and all of these were like five, 10, 20%, that tells you your phase three can't, can't get a positive result. 
the, the, even with this kind of phase two size, with these kind of positive outcomes, you know, if this up here was 10%, that tells you your phase three can't deliver because you've only got a 10% chance of success. So that means your phase three has to be bigger. So you can, you can do these kind of exercises and then you can color them in and say, which combinations of phase two design and outcome gives me a high chance of success, which are low. And it tells you something about the value of the information that you're going to generate. And that literally, you can do it in an hour. It's that easy to do. So anyway, worth thinking about. And then it, this, this just picks out an example, which I'll skip past. Uh, so I, that, that whole idea of con thinking about the true POS, you, you don't even need your phase two data. You can conceptualize what kind of, what does it have to look like to be successful? And I think that's kind of helpful, um, generally speaking. And, and I just give a simple example, but in principle, I think it's quite helpful. Um, you can also use adaptive designs um, to help you with decision making because you're making decisions as, a, as the data unfold. A warning here, though, if you're going to do this kind of thing, it's very, very important to do it properly, and it's very important that you have agreement if it's going to be a pivotal study with FDA or EMEA because um, you can really do these things wrong. You can mess up the power and the type 1 error. So it has to be done very carefully, but if done properly, then they can be helpful. Um, so you could have, you know, so here's an example, new drug, there's two doses they want to be evaluated. There's an early interim wanted to deselect a dose and also check if the sample size is good. If not, maybe we increase the sample size and then we continue the rest of the study. That's a, uh, th so this is a real example I'm going to show you now. So I can't tell you if it's real. So the question is, is when you do that e early interim, this thing where you're going to do an interim to, to, to select, when do I do it? And in this case, this was a progression free survival. The hypothesis was an improvement of two and a half months. That was a hypothesis in the study. And based on the recruitment profile, I'm going to go through all this, but you can plot as a, the sample size is in blue. There's a number of patients in blue over time. And then once you get to 18 months, you've got like 450 subjects. The red is the number of PFS events. How many events do I get at any point in time? It will grow as the trial grows. So it's very important when you're thinking about interims and that kind of thing to make decisions is to understand how much information, how many, how many events you have at any point in time. So here I have 300 patients, but I've only got 100 events. Can I do an interim then? Is that enough? So in this example, uh, the sponsor wanted to do it as early as possible. I said, well, you can't, because if you do it really early, you've got no events. If we try and do this analysis at six months to choose the doses, you've got eight PFS events. That's what the number there is. That's, that's the number of events. Sorry, sorry uh, 20 events at seven and a half months. Sorry, 20 PFS events. The first number in red is the time of the analysis, and the second one is the number of events. And this is the sample size. And this drop down is when you, I've deselected a dose. So I drop a dose and then recruitment carries with two arms. Because it started with three, but I drop one and go to two. That's what that little break's for. So that's not a good, this is not a good time. Seven and a half months, I don't have enough data. So you then, okay, well, what if I do it at nine months? I've got 33 events. And you grow like that. You go through it to see when is a good time. What was decided in this instance was here. Analysis at 11 and a half months into the study, 67 events. We'll make a decision, then we'll drop a dose. It's the only way, and there's all sorts of reasons and statistics behind that choice. But the principle is, you need to get your statistician to do that. Because unless you see that, you don't know what you're doing. And as I've seen lots of trials that don't plot that out, and these make arbitrary choices as to when they're going to do analyses. And then they make a, a mess of the dose decision, and you think, well, why? Because they didn't think about it. So that's, that's an adaptive design. And that design has been submitted and agreed with FDA with the simulation code and everything else. So that's been accepted. It actually looks like this. This is the actual design. So you have, you have so many patients randomized. Then you have this analysis here at 11 and a half months. There's a, a selection. So we, we drop one of the doses and we just continue with these two. And then there's a, an analysis that takes place on PFS here. And then we follow up for survival. Boom, boom, boom. So that's just a quick. Now that, that helps your decision making because it helps the sponsor decide which uh, schedule to use and you can make sure 
that you have enough information to make a good choice. You can calculate the overall power or the overall expected power from that design for this interim at 67 events. And without that, they were thinking of running all three arms out or doing a different phase two and then a phase three, which would take longer and cost more. So we rolled it into, into one design. So this was a phase two or a phase, phase three? Phase three. Yeah, that's, that's a phase three study. Yeah, because we end up with that many events at the end. It's quite a lot of it. It's a big study at the end. Uh, yeah, but that's phase three. That's gone through now. Uh, How much data did they have before that? Did they, did they do yeah, they had, yeah, there, there, was some, there was some data that existed in some single arm cohorts. They had less than 20 subjects in one cohort, and I think it was f 13 or 14 in one, and I can't remember, maybe it was 19 in another, where they'd done some um, phase one dose escalation and a bit of expansion in a single arm setting. And there was also some pharmacology work done in relation to the schedule, scheduling and the amount of exposure you would have, because it's not really two doses, it's two schedules of, of delivery. Um, and they couldn't really easily tell from the data that they had which schedule. Both looked to be active, the question was which to choose. And there was all sorts of debate about which would be safe and so on and so forth. So the only answer really was to get more data, and then they, they were going to have a separate phase two, and then, it was, then their timelines were going to be messed up. So in the end, we ended up with that, making that proposal. Um, had an FDA call about that just actually last week about this design. Um, so that's, that can help you deal with some difficulties in your decision making if you use these designs properly. Uh, it can be helped. Single arm studies, so get, get me on the watch. Single arm studies, okay, because I know you guys, uh, the SDS, want to talk about this. Single arm studies, yeah, three biggest issues. Single arm studies are the kind of thing where somebody said, it's fine, we're going to look for a signal. We're going to put 12 pages and look for a signal. What's the signal? Uh, every, uh, everybody's writing a piece of paper what a definition of a signal is and wave it in the air and it'll be different. Well, what the hell is a signal? It's meaningless drivel is what a signal is. Well, you know, one of the... Well, you just, why don't you just... You know, you're better off taking your money to the casino... And putting it on, you've probably got better chances, you know, than, get, than getting that kind of decision right. It's, I, one of the worst, I hate it when somebody says, oh, we're looking for a signal. God, <laughs> I really don't like it. Um, it's nonsense. And you've got horrible bias. And people say, oh, well, you're going to use matching methods. And, and no doubt that people try their very best to do, to do this. A good intent to try and do matching against some historical data or some registry data. So it's not in a inherently a bad thing. People do, there's whole bunches of folks who spend a long time trying to match your single arm data to external data. And by and large, they genuinely try and do the best they can. But it's unfortunately, it's, there's no escaping that there's no, there's no substitute for randomization. Nothing can remove bias like a randomization. You can't remove bias here. You can only adjust for the things that you've measured. You can't adjust for the things you didn't measure. And that's the fundamental problem and always has been with a single arm study. Now, uh, Pazda from FDA recently commented about his dislike for single arm studies or his, um, his, la his relative lack of enthusiasm, let's say, <laughs> <laughs> uh, for, for those. But um, uh, because FDA, you know, they've, they've approved a number of drugs on single arm studies, as you know. EMEA have not approved a single drug on single arm data that I'm aware of in oncology. There's only one that I'm aware of, and it was actually in Lifidase, which was, uh, well, it had a positive opinion in the summertime, and that's a Hansa Swedish company. That's the only one I know of in, in, in renal, that where the Europeans have considered approval on a single set, a single arm uh, data set. Uh, so anyway, so, but there is a way that the strategy can, can help with this. It's called Bayesian augmentation. It's where you have a very heavily imbalanced randomization. So instead of it, you might be four to one. So you might have a trial with, uh, you might have a trial with, uh, let's say, 40 patients on drug and 10 on control. Randomized, very heavily imbalanced. Now, the thing that gives you is it ensures that the issue of patient selection bias is dealt with by the fact you've got a randomization. But the problem is you've not got enough control. So then you can top up the control uh, with 
um, is, a, is a compromise if you do it properly. So you add external data onto those 10 randomized subjects. You add it on top. Now, it sounds easy, but that's actually quite a complicated maneuver to do that properly and correctly. But it is actually not a bad idea because it's better than single arm. It's not as good as a fully blown randomized trial, but it's a damn sight better than a single arm trial. So it's definitely, I think, something that you might see more of as time passes. And I'll give you a quick example. This is a real example. So here's, here's a, a trial where it's three to one randomized. Now, um, under the, un, under the uh, th these are actual data that came out of this trial, three to one randomized. Three successes out of eight, 14 out of 30. And that, that, was, the d that was the data that came out. So you see the red and the green. Now, there might be data externally on placebo from some appropriate registry where you've matched the best you can. And that might be the, the data in the dotted lines that you've seen externally. And what you do is you add that dotted to the, to the faded out and you end up with a new line here. And that's your, that's your, net, that's your new placebo, old data plus, uh, randomized data plus historical data. And then you can compare the two distributions. So if you did it uh, with the trial data, the chance the drug is superior is about 66%, but if you do it with augmentation, it's about 94. Now, there's a lot of stuff behind that. You know, I'm doing it very whizzing past it right here now. But if you apply the right methods and you have the right kind of external data, and that means you'll be very careful about the individual patient external data, they need to have the same characteristics measured. Not only do you need to have an external data set of, say, 200 patients in a registry, you need to randomly select the patients out of that registry for your study. You can't go picking them. You can have a pool of 200 and randomly pull out 50 or whatever you need. If you do it properly, then you can use augmentation to boost your ability to see the differences between drug and placebo. So that's a quick example. Uh, there's okay, a couple of other ones here. These, this, actually, this is an example that was published. This was Novartis. Um, I forgot when it was now. But they did something, I think it was in, was it in Crohn's. It was in Crohn's. And they did exactly this thing. They didn't call it Bayesian augmentation, but exactly the same. Small placebo group added in external data and got a POC, it was phase two. So you can look at that as a publication. There's recently, you may have heard of this from Medicina, where um, uh, this was a, a release from Medicina, uh, where they said the proposed phase three trial includes a three to one randomization of drug to SOC and an additional matched external control. That's actually not quite correct. Be I'll explain why. But anyway, the primary endpoint uh, is a one-to-one -one analysis because what's happening is they're, all, they're adding the placebos to that to make it one-to-one. -one. So they, the, the, the missing gap between three to one, they add it and then you end up with, with equal numbers on each arm, so it's one-to-one. -one. It, you might think that that external control arm kind of stands on its own, but it doesn't. It's combined with the, with the randomized placebo. And so you can see. Uh, it's important to, to note that that is not a synthetic control arm, despite, oh, hang on. oh I've taken it off, uh, I've missed it, it's, it's in a, a, it might be my other presentation, despite what, um, the, 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 there's, a, there's a group, and oh God, is it, are they part of Cineos? I can't remember who they're part of now, but um, there's a group out there that were purchased by one of the big CROs, I'll find out later because I can't remember, and they are offering the construction, they're offering synthetic control arms to companies. Come to us, we've got this big data set of uh, control arms from a whole bunch of trials. We can give you a synthetic control arm. First of all, synthetic control is just a made up thing. It doesn't mean anything. Secondly, it's no different than going to a registry and taking your patients out. Thirdly, it's not true that, because th th these guys who Medicina worked with claimed that this example was um, an example of the use of a of a synthetic control arm. And uh, so I challenged him about it and said it's not true because you're just augmenting. It's not a standalone control arm, it's different, which then conceded. But be careful because folks are out in the wider world trying to sell you this notion that you can have a single arm study and a synthetic control arm. No, 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 no. The only, the only example they've got to point to, the only time it's ever been accepted by FDA is as an augmentation, randomized plus, not treatment X, and then a completely separate control arm where we compare. So just be careful about that because there's, there's a lot of misinformation about this particular example. 
Okay, another one. Oh, this is another quick. Lots. Look at that. Could you ever want more, more numbers on a slide? You couldn't, could you? It's work. It's beautiful. So, but uh, so th this is just a simple ex augmentation. This is a real example again, where um, there was relatively um, small number of patients that were going to be examined at an interim. This was an interim where they would have seven patients on each of two doses, only phase two, and they would look at how many responses they had: one, two, three, four, through seven. Well, not through seven. So first uh, dose one and dose two, and you can cross tabulate and uh, the, the first set of numbers are just simply uh, the number of responses, you know, one, zero, two, zero, three, zero, depending on where you are. And then the next two sets of probabilities is what's the probability that the first dose is effective uh, as the first number there, and the second number is what's the probability the second dose is effective versus the hypotheses that were set out at the beginning. So you can look at any of these combinations and figure out at what point do I have a high probability that either the second dose is effective, or the first dose is effective. And I could also look at the, I could also decide to look at the data across the doses. I have three uh, responses on the first dose and six on the second, so that's nine. And that, the last probability, is a probability of nine out of out of fourteen. What's the chance that that then would indicate the drug was effective? So there's a lot of numbers there. Don't worry too much about it. The point is, is that you can you can do appropriate statistics that tell you what combination of outcomes you need to have a relatively high probability that your drug is effective. So you can then make some good decisions. So this one is just looking at the two, the two arms diff, uh, kind of independently. And this one is the same grid where I look at the data from the two arms combined. So anything up here, I'm not doing very good. Orange, I might have some evidence that the drug's going to be effective. And green, I'm fairly confident that and so you can do these things in advance. You don't have to wait for your data. And it helps you think about what outcomes you need to make good decisions. So that's just another real example. Uh, right, OK, I've got maybe five minutes left. So I'll just whiz through this. Um, so we've done all of that. So, but you know, people say, well, you know, if the data are great, blow that statistical rubbish. I think it's fantastic. So that's what we need. If it's, if it's clear cut, then we're good. OK, so here is an example of such. This um, company now doesn't exist, Targacept. Back 2010, 9, 2010, they produced astonishing results in treatment resistant depression. Astonishing. A handy scale, won't go into it, but Cero AstraZeneca Seroquel sold $4 billion a year on, in this indication for a two-point difference on the HAMD. This thing is absolutely enormous. So this data come out, and all the big farmers go, whoa, brilliant data. So pile in to try and buy it. OK, so that's what you've got. So you've got these very positive set of phase two results, huge treatment effect, so on and so forth, taking it at face value. POS very high, P piece of cake. Don't really need any statistics. It's it's a it's no brainer, no brainer. That was licensed. Deal was 1.2 billion. In 2011, 2012, there was four randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trials came out within about four months of each other. Every single one was negative. Development terminated. Very very shortly after that, if you look at it, Sudetalia so was closed. So, you know, AZ anyway, within about three weeks. Um, and th 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 there's other examples like this where you see these apparently brilliant phase two data that bomb. Now, the, now the issue here, uh, now this is, where I, this is where I won't write something on the slide, but the, is the issue here is um, if your data are too good to be, be true, they probably are. And you should do due diligence. And if you do the due diligence and somebody finds out that the data are driven by a single site, the largest site, and that the response rate of placebo is zero and on drug it's like 85%, whereas in all the other sites, the response rate's like 70% on each arm. And the investigator had access to the random scheme at that site. And you also find that the Z value, the, the, the statistical significance of the data from this one site of, of the uh, what is it, 12 or 15 sites they had, 
the p-value is so extraordinary, you're more likely to win the lottery two weeks in succession than you were that that result was real. Now, if you have, you're in possession of that information, then common sense should kick in. You say, no, we shouldn't buy this thing because there's probably some, this data might not be real. Or on the other hand, you can say, well, I don't give a damn about that. Here's 1.2 billion, and then you fail. So, you know, so, and then it has real consequences because you start shutting down your R&D unnecessarily to cover up the fact you made a diabolical decision. Um, anyway, uh, so, but this is what it's really about. <laughs> so it's really about, and the, the folks you deal with, this is the problem that, you, this happens more in big, big pharma, I think, and I've, I've made it clear. But there is, there is this thing. Our, our drug's fantastic. When is the last time that you had a, a phase three trial delivered a positive result, or a phase two to make a really good result, and your, uh, your senior exec, or if you're a statistician, your head of R&D or your CMO comes to you and says, oh, great data on you know, drug X. I'm like, oh, that's fantastic. Can you just do me you know, a bunch of subgroup analyses bunch of to show me a result that's not significant? Because you know, I'd, I'd like to do a bunch of analyses that shows me this result isn't real. How often has anybody ever said, take a positive result <laughs> and destroy it? No. How often is it the other way around? The trial didn't deliver. Oh, didn't get a treatment effect. It's obviously the drug's great. It's fantastic. Something wrong with the trial. Please go and torture the data. You know, somebody should call Amnesty International at some point. The amount of <laughs> torture it until it confesses. And then, ah, great. And that hideous bias runs right through the middle of pharma. And it's basically nobody wants to know that their baby is ugly. And, so, and then you get delusional. And that, you get, statisticians get pressured to do stupid analyses. And you spend more money on it. You fail. And you wonder why. It's like, you know, what's wrong with you? But, so it's unavoidable. You can't, you can't avoid risk. But this unflinching belief that your data is fine, that your drug is fine and the data are wrong or the trial is wrong, is, is pervasive. And it's why you have a 50% failure rate. I swear I started at the beginning, and it's this. It's not the science. It's the lack of scientific thinking. It's the Scientology that undermines many, and, and, and that happens, I mean, I get lots of clients I work with, and unfortunately, it's, big, it's a big problem with the big pharma, no doubt, but it is there as well, because many of the smaller companies are populated with big pharma. But anyway, so, just wanted to say that. Now, I, I, the last, I'm not gonna go through these, but there's a whole bunch of things that you can do, com as well as the statistics, common sense. You can design some good studies, might randomize, that usually helps, you can also, consider performing two phase twos. Because if you, you can get lucky in one, you know, uh, you, 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 you can say, oh, my phase two, oh, it's negative, but no, it's just a bad trial design. I oh, know, we need to go look for data. It's, you're on, if it's negative in two, you're probably negative. Um, and then you can do some maths here to demonstrate that there's ways of doing that. That doesn't mean you don't have to have two big phase twos. You can work your way around it and have slightly smaller phase twos. Um, Obvious things, go in the, the right patient population. Don't go into a patient population that don't have the biomarker or don't have the, 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 the enzyme or the, or the mutation you're interested in. And as I was showing before, predefine what is positive, what is negative. Why don't you say that in advance? What constitutes a positive outcome so that you don't play the delusional game when you don't get the data that you want? Uh, show the expected power, that's what I talked about earlier. The, ass the assurance, what is it? What is it? What is the real chance of success? Analysis and interpretation. Try and do ITT. <laughs> Be careful if you're doing interims. Do them properly. Have some go, no, go decision rules. It will help you to avoid making the bad decisions and various things. Uh, You've got to be careful about you know, foraging for signals and be careful of uh, post hoc analyses. And all these common sense things. It's the failure to really consider these things and do excuse me, and do that, that causes problems. It's the failure to do that. All these things I can list here, and lots more on that, which I'm not going to go through. Mm. But basically, <laughs> okay, so I'm going to finish off here by saying, you, you've got to have a good design phase twos, I think, are critical in drug development. You've got to do them properly. But more important is objective interpretation. 
and careful use of concepts like expected power and predefined, they can help. They won't solve the problem, but they can definitely help you. And, and they can enhance rational, effective, and data-driven decision-making. They can help you be scientific. But, but statistics is not enough. You've got to have experienced, credible, non-evangelical decision-makers who can understand and interpret data objectively for what they are and not what they desire. That is absolutely critical. You can, I can bang my head on the wall all day. The statistician get absolutely nowhere if nobody's listening and they want a signal and that's it. So just be careful. There we go. Thank you. Uh,